Hey, everyone, this is Tom Salemi of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Please be careful when lifting this podcast episode. It is very heavy. Don't lift with your back. It's uh, probably our longest episode ever. In fact, I checked that it is our longest episode ever, but it's totally worth it. So if you're one of those people who like to do the running thing, you're probably fit. So this is probably like a half marathon. If you're one of those garden people, I'm thinking you're going to get a lot of weeding done this weekend. It's hopefully a nice weekend where you are. This will help with that. If you're going to mow a lawn, if it's a big one, we got you covered. So there's lots going on in this podcast episode. We've got a couple of great stories. Both companies, LimbFlow and Shockwave Medical, are focused on the peripheral vascular space. We'll talk about their technologies and their approaches. But uh, I really, as always, love to get the stories from, uh, from the folks that we're interviewing. Dan Rose has an interesting path uh, to his role as CEO of LimbFlow. He has uh, spent a good portion of his career abroad, and uh, he'll explain why. And then later on, I speak with Doug Godshaw, the CEO and president of Shockwave Medical. He also had a unique path into medtech. But uh, I really found his uh, discussion about hardware, where he had been CEO, particularly interesting. So uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy that as well. I'm grateful to our sponsor, Confluent Medical, for sponsoring this episode. We'll be hearing from them throughout. And uh, of course, we'll have Chris Newmarker here with the top news of the week. He and I kept it short and tight, although we talked a bit about poutine and uh, Sonny and Cher. So maybe we got off the rails just a bit, but uh, I hope you enjoy that as well. Please do remember that uh, Device Talks Boston is coming up on May 10th and 11th. And Device Talks Minnesota is coming up June 6th and 7th. We've got agendas for both up there. We have the opportunity for you to save. Please use the code DTW25, Device Talks Weekly 25, to save 25%. And when you do register, do reach out, or if you've already registered, uh, reach out to me via uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, our good friends at Goodwin will be having a, uh, a party at their office on uh, the, the evening of the 10th. And uh, if you're at the conference, you're invited to attend. And I'll make sure you get the, uh, the link and the RSVP. So uh, once, you, uh, once you register, find me on LinkedIn and Twitter, and I'll uh, make sure our, uh, our event staff reaches out to you with the invite. So we'd love to uh, have an opportunity to meet you in person at the meeting or uh, at a, a fun time at uh, Goodwin's offices in the seaport. So lots of uh, good times ahead. Please uh, don't miss them. Go to devicetalks.com to register for those. And of course, while you're there, register for our upcoming Device Talks Tuesdays episode. It's brought to you by TE Connectivity. The title is Advanced Catheter Designs, Optimizing for Precision and Profile. It's free. It's available on demand. It starts at 4 p.m. If you want to watch it live, 4 p.m. on Tuesday, 4 p.m. Eastern, and would love to have you part of that conversation. So go to devicetalks.com to register for all this very cool stuff. Finally, before I let you go, I included some links on the show notes. Uh, I'll talk about some videos in the interview, particularly with, uh, with Doug Godshall of Shockwave. And the videos are really great explainers of, uh, of their technology and of their origin. So uh, check those out if you need some more information. That's it. Let's go. All right. You ready for this? Ready. This new marker. Tom Salami. I have no time for our hijinks today, Chris Newmarker. Yeah, I guess too, so. too much going on, organizing two meetings, organizing Device Talks Boston, which is happening May 10th and 11th in Boston, and yep. of course Device Talks Minnesota, which is happening June 6th and 7th Woo-hoo. in Minnesota, and I am out of my mind busy, but but this podcast is our baby, yeah. Chris. We can't ignore it, we right? We can. No. That's right. We got a warm bottle. Yeah, <laughs> gotta, gotta get, test the formula on the old forearm. Get a little lullaby going. <laughs> I had this conversation with Jim Hammer, and I, I never did lullabies. All, the only song I knew sung to my children was "Take Me Up to the Ball Game," which worked. But like, that's a fun uh, song. Other than that, I'm not, I've that got with my kids. I've got like no like Swedish folk songs that I can sing to them to instill peace and good feelings. No, nothing. 
I don't have any Swedish folk songs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might. There. I mean, I am in Minnesota. You know, there, That's right. Sure oh yeah, yeah, are, yeah. That's right. Yeah, there are. Oh yeah, there are people oh, yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so let, let us uh, let us move quickly through the yes. device through the new markers, <laughs> newsmakers. Uh, but uh, do remind folks that uh, these conferences uh, are, are coming together. Yeah. They're looking awesome, and you should be there so we can meet you in person. We have but, a nice pile of lefts uh, at the table in, in Device Talks, Minnesota. A nice pile of what? Lefts, like a little lefts, or like, or like. Is that like walleye? No, it's like a nice <laughs> Swedish dessert bread that's like, you know, this flat bread. You put a little, little butter on it, a little, little cinnamon. Do they sell it at Ikea? Probably, I think they do. All right. Well, we'll go to Ikea. Yeah. We'll, we'll score to Ikea. some left. Uh, or if get you know, some, if get you some got meatballs it. too, some linen berry jam. <laughs> Hook me up with some left stuff. If you have a left supplier <laughs> in Minnesota, we'll make it happen. There we go. All I right. Mean, you know, maybe I can figure out how to make it myself. Like, I, I have uh, like uh, a little left. No, that's not terrible. You're a pretty busy man there, yeah, Chris. I'm not going to be. I don't want you cooking for 300. Yeah, no, that seems a little crazy. All right. What is number five on the New Markers Newsmakers, Chris? <laughs> on that note, <laughs> number five. Well, number five on the list. Uh, this is this Uh-oh. is tough news. Right, we got to um, turn the turn the tone down. Yes, yes. So yeah, number five on the list. We've got uh, you know even uh, you know even more um, you know ventilator recall problems for uh, for Philips. Uh, um, you know some and another round of, of recalls that FDA says are uh, are class for one. Um, in this case, it in, involves uh, you know some uh, some circuit um, issues. Uh, with uh, with some of the ventilators, so you know they've been you know they've been working through a lot a lot of problems you know like uh, you know since last year when you know there was just this huge recall involving a uh, sound abatement foam and uh, yeah it, it just looks like there's um, you know a few a few more extra things they're they're working through as uh, as well so here's to hoping that uh, they're uh, they're able to turn a corner with us soon. Absolutely, absolutely, and I know it's uh, it's come up for a couple of the other companies we talked to, ResMed and and Vapotherm. Actually, I think oh, and in uh, Inspire Medical is yeah. uh, is certainly um, stepping up to uh, to meet the demand. So actually, I think Inspire Medical, not Vapotherm, what, what I was thinking about, but uh, Inspire Medical, and we'll be at Device Talks Minnesota, and uh, Tim Herbert will be uh, the CEO, will be one of our keynote. Uh, Keynotes there. I'll interview him, and I'm sure Which we'll, is we'll really talk about neat. This. I mean, this is like uh, they. I mean, they've got an implantable neuromod tech. You know that. You know, yep. so it's so instead of like rest, you know, ventilators, CPAPs, whatnot. You know, you're you're. It's a whole new level of technology there with them. Um, you know, ResMed's really interesting. They've been you know trying to you know ratchet up you know, their production to you know meet all this extra demand with like Philips out of the market for now, but. Um, you know they've been hitting supply chain problems. It's a it's a really interesting story, but um, unfortunately there are a lot of people who have uh, sleep apnea problems. So. Absolutely. So we'll talk with Tim Herbert about that and other issues. And Inspire also is putting together a uh, one of our professional development discussions, and it's happening on uh, June seventh, the second day of Device Talks Minnesota. We'll have Martin Abrams, Vice President of Marketing and Customer Experience. And Jordan Grace Miller, marketing director, talking about keeping the consumer first in medtech. So that should be a, a really important conversation. That sounds great. Yeah, no, a lot of a lot of DTC going on in medtech. So uh, I mean, one of the I mean, that's just one of the really like really you know interesting companies here right now in, in Minnesota in the space. So that yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to that. It's gonna be great. Amen. Amen. What is number four <laughs> on this vaunted news marker? News marker? News, new markers, newsmakers list. New markers, newsmakers. Well, number four here, we've got, uh, you know, Johnson Johnson MedTech. Uh, that's the new name for their medical device business. You know, they even capitalized the T in the middle of it. Johnson Johnson MedTech. They are uh, they are shopping for M&A. They are, they are looking for the deals. Um, and that, that was like one of the big things we got out of their uh, quarterly earnings call uh, this week. Um, so they're, uh, and it, it doesn't matter matter what the size is. They, they said it was more like they're looking for a strategic fit. And, uh, you know, Ashley McAvoy, the EVP of MedTech, you know, said uh, her quote was, we're going to continue to do tuck-ins and to really digitize the patient experience. So it, it looks like this is a lot about, you know, the, you know, like many medical device companies, they're, you know, making the shift from just being like a, you know, company that makes the hardware that makes the devices to being a company that, you know, has all these like digital offerings and services around their, uh, their devices and they're, uh, they're, they're shopping for, for, for deals to add to what they can offer. I think I need a, a plug alert sound effect like uh, like our SPAC attack just uh, because now I'm going to tell you that we'll have to pew synthes at Device Talks Boston talking about uh, 
their journey from a medical device to a med tech capital T organization. Yeah. And there you go. Great, great panel with Rajiv Kamal, who had been on the podcast a few months ago, but also Anita Barnick, Vice President of Research and Development, Jennifer DeBoard, Senior Director of Supply Chain, Christine Christo, Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs, and Therese Kelly, Director of Global Education Solutions. So that's going to be great. And yeah, definitely like, yeah, you got to be at Device Talks Boston and, you know, find out more from these you know, Depew officials about this like journey that they're taking to, you know, digitize and you know, become kind of more of this like medical technology company. Absolutely. So, yeah, really cool. Yeah, we'll have a conversation with from them and Stryker will be uh, speaking to something similar. So it, it is a, it is. You need shopping music. When I said there was, they were shopping for m and deals, you need to shop in music, like something like, you know, I don't know, Kmart type music? sound. Like, 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 like stuff you hear, like little... maybe some 70s jam with, uh, yeah, with a loot like... or something like that, or 80s music, like. Yeah, I haven't really heard Jethro Tall like, well, like going around <laughs> shopping. Maybe, a maybe place. White I mean, Wedding with an acoustic guitar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, an acoustic version. Of, I like that. Yeah, right, like, well. you're like going through the store and you're like, oh, that's like, oh, that's White Wedding. Like, wow. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. That's oh, right. that smells like Teen Spirit. It's an acoustic version of Smells <laughs> oh, Like Teen Spirit. <laughs> that would be something to hear for yeah, sure. Maybe something there, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's get cracking on that. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, what is it? You're going you're gonna to get out the guitar after this you know, like yeah i will get something. it out i will learn how to play it and then i will perform i will be performing at device talks boston no, at device not, talks boston will, that's right yeah. i will not be doing that i promise everybody get 50 people at your company to register for dice talks boston and tom will play <laughs> for, like teen spirit i will if, if you could gary if you can show me you've registered 50 people at device talks boston i will get up there and play the guitar even though i don't know how to play it'll be fun yeah, yeah. So or, be. or chris and i will sing a duet how's that Mm. <laughs> I got it'll be uh I think it might be a duet of one time. Uh, it might be a duet little, of one. Little Sunny and Cher action. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not singing I got you big. <laughs> Before we begin this interview with Daniel Rose of Limflow, I'd like to bring in our sponsor, Confluent Medical Technologies. I'm talking with Christine Trepigny. She is Chief Technology Officer at Confluent. Christine, tell me, what does Confluent do? Confluent Medical Technologies' mission is to bring together key technologies to service five key markets. Neurovascular, structural heart, electrophysiology, peripheral vascular, as well as interventional pomology. We evaluate and develop technologies required to produce products for these key markets. Um, to give you a few examples, first, structural heart market. We manufacture highly durable nitinol frames that are used in conjunction with biomedical textiles covering as well as complex delivery systems that are used to deploy and deliver these technologies in vivo. Another example would be neurovascular in the neurovascular space to treat stroke and aneurysms would be to, we also develop and manufacture thin wall nitinol tubing. And we also have the capabilities to use very precise uh, laser technologies to laser cut nitinol tubing to manufacture neurovascular products. And these are used in conjunction with film cast PTFE to produce uh, aspiration catheters. Our set of capabilities range from gun drilling precision tube hollows that are used to manufacture precision tubing. We also manufacture um, nitinol implants and components, biomedical textiles, PTFE liners, polyemid tubing, balloon catheters, and complex catheters. We'll be back with the rest of my interview with Christine Trepigny little later in the podcast. If you'd like more information about Confluent Medical, go to confluentmedical.com. Well, Dan Rose, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. So I want to learn a lot about Limflow, but uh, you and I started talking before we even push record about where you are and sort of how you got there. So let's go back to the, let's go to the beginning and learn a little bit about your background and how it led you to uh, to leading medtech companies in Switzerland, where you are now. So how did it all start yeah. out for you? <laughs> it's a little bit of a um, non-traditional story, as it were. So I'm American. I grew up in, uh, in Virginia and uh, ended up going to UVA uh, undergrad and then spent a couple of years working overseas after that. And then coming back again to UVA to do uh, business school, I was at Darden. And then as I was at Darden, I, I kind of got interested in venture capital. I was uh, had some classes with a guy named John Glenn, pretty well-known Silicon Valley guy. And I uh, thought, wow, that'd be really cool if I could uh, if I get a job doing that. 
and so and I also know that I wanted to go back to back overseas, particularly to Europe. So I started a little Dan Rose needs a job campaign, and uh, <laughs> and I got out the. Uh, it was actually back then. It was like a um, you know a book of you know Darden alumni. You know, I was going to say, what, did, what does that look like without LinkedIn yeah, or Instagram exactly. or, or TikTok it, where you it, can build a involved, resume? It involved faxes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you were at the cutting edge of technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. some emails, but there were faxes definitely involved. <laughs> and, uh, and I just uh, started networking and flew myself over to Europe uh, over Christmas and traveled around to three or four different countries and came back with a job. That's great. So uh, in London, which was an awesome place to be in 1999, that was back then. And uh, with a small venture capital group, boutique group doing seed stage work in, in med tech, believe it or not. And uh, I didn't really know what med tech was, but uh, the job sounded good and London sounded good. So I uh, transplanted myself and went to work for what was called High Plains Investment Group then. And as part of my work there, I ended up I would go around to universities looking for technology to spin out and okay. uh, ended up spinning out some uh, continuous glucose monitoring technology from uh, University of Manchester and uh, co-founding a device company around that called IIT, which uh, we raised some money and uh, put it into clinical trials and very quickly realized it was not working. So it was one of those fail fast scenarios, which was just perfect, right? I kind of learned a ton and uh, I got my fingers burned a little bit. You know, we actually decided it wasn't going to work, returned the rest of the money that we had left over to the investors, returned the IP. So did it the right way. And I ended up actually uh, moving to Switzerland at that point because my partner, my girlfriend at that time was, uh, was from Switzerland. And uh, I reached out to another well-known, uh, well, a well-known uh, Darden alumni, Bill Hawkins. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Uh, and, uh, I have heard of uh, him. Sure. Yeah. I wrote Bill a, a, an email, never met him. And he responded within 15 minutes and said, yeah, Hey, let me introduce you to, to some people at the Medtronic, uh, headquarters and here in Switzerland. And yeah, I had a couple job offers from Medtronic and picked one and, uh, went to work in, in, I guess a real med tech company and started off in, uh, in cardiac surgery technologies as it was known back then. So, uh, which, you know, we had a big perfusion business, you know, custom packs. We had a big valve business. We also had something called cardiac surgery technologies, which was off pump bypass surgery, mm -hmm. uh, radio frequency ablation, surgical for AF and anastomotic technologies. And there was a lot of excitement around anastomotic technologies back then. There was Ventrica and other things going on. So, uh, so yeah, I was head of marketing for Europe, ran, uh, did a bunch of product launches over about three years. And then Ended up being approached by Pat Mackin, who you probably have run across at some point, CEO of Cryo Life, which is now Artivion, I think. They mm -hmm. just changed the name. Hey, Before we, we go there, I do want to unpack a few things. What was the appeal about living in Europe? A lot of people have that desire. I'm just curious. Why did you want to work there? Yeah, uh, this goes back to just like I'm a compulsive traveler. Mm -hmm. I always have been super interested uh in, uh, you know, kind of international relations, foreign affairs, and going everywhere that I can and seeing everything that I can. So That's great. the idea that I could kind of work and still get more cultural exposure and see the world was, uh, was very, very attractive to me and always has been. I mean, I come back, I think in 2019, I traveled 50 weeks. Wow. And, you know, went to the US 14 times. So uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of movement. And uh, so yeah, the, luckily, the last two years for you been a uh, respite or have it, has it driven you absolutely crazy? <laughs> I survived. I survived. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a little, uh, a little different than the normal pace of life. I would say I've always been like that. I'm, I'm tremendously curious and I love to see what's on the other side of the hill. So, uh, and so I've just been uh, always eager to do that and, uh, and quite comfortable. Uh, yeah. In different cultures, different settings. So uh, one of the attractions for me. And to drill down on your, your fail fast experience, I don't know, as you were talking, it, I just kind of had an idle thought and I don't know if there's any meat to it at all, but fail fast is a great thing and it's good to find out quickly if something doesn't work. I'm wondering if startups today fail as much as they used to, or if you're able to fail so fast, you don't hear about spectacular failures anymore in startups and maybe it's selective memory on my part. Do you think there's anything to that, that we're finding out a lot sooner, whether technologies work or is it the same as it's been? I know I it's an off the beat question, but. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is a really interesting one because you could take the opposite side and say there's a lot of med tech companies that limp along and maybe 
should fail faster. Right. Right. Yep. And it's, it is very inefficient way we fund companies. A lot of times really incredible things that can change the world can't get funded because they don't fit, they don't kind of pattern match into what's been done before. And then there are a lot of people limping along with pretty derivative technologies that are being funded because they look a lot like things that have done before, but mm. aren't really differentiated and are never going to, you know, you can say you're going to compete with Medtronic and Edwards and Boston with your slightly better technology, but simply you can't, right? So there's also a sense of there's some things that just honestly shouldn't go forward, right? Yeah, and, and a little bit of zombies. So it works both ways, right? It's not a in any way uh, uh, a fair or or efficient process that we do in med tech, right? There's a lot of regularity in results. But yeah, it's a good question, right? About uh, how fast should you pull the plug when you realize it's not going to work? Right. And then how hard should you fight when you're not getting funded? That's right. <laughs> which is, which is, you know, the a series A and the seed are absolutely the hardest, you know, I've been through it numerous times and they're just tremendously difficult to have the courage to continue and get through it and, and make it to the next level. Right. And, uh, Sometimes you're not sure if you're burning good days, good hours of your life, right? For something that's never going to move. I think that's one of the hardest things. That is true. And, and uh, you raise a good point too. You don't see the, uh, the level of Me Too investments that you used to, where everyone would have to have this kind of thing in their portfolio, rental renovation or whatever it was, some sort of spinal implant. Uh, everyone seemed to have, need to have one of everything. But circling back to your, your time in Medtronic and Bill Hawkins comes up a lot. I think he's, uh, he's really... Uh, brought a lot of people into this industry. We had a couple of people in a recent episode that uh, also credited Bill Hawkins for, for bringing them in. So you're at Medtronic. What sort of, uh, I love to explore these moments when people say, I want to try something different. I want to leave the, the certainty of, of this position, quote unquote certainty, and try their time somewhere else. What was, uh, talk a bit about that transition and what was that new opportunity for you? Well, I mean, there are a couple of ways that th that kind of moment came to me. One was I was in Medtronic and I was offered another job in Medtronic, but a big change. And I was told by a very senior person in Medtronic back then that when you change jobs, you only change one thing. You can change the business, you can change the geography, or you can change the function, but don't change any more than one, which is a reasonable way to think about things. This job was changing all three. <laughs> so, so you you take advice really well, don't you? I I, 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 I I heard, but I did not listen. <laughs> and so I, uh, Pat Mackin back then asked me, who was running Vascular, asked me to go up and run Vascular Nordic, which was three different businesses: coronary vascular, so drug loading stents, basically, and that, that portfolio from Medtronic, peripheral, which was pretty small at that point, and uh, the endovascular, the AAA business, and thoracic uh, endographic. So. Uh, and I had four, well, five with Iceland countries, several different currencies, a bunch of health, different healthcare systems, and three different teams. So it was a super job for me working out of Stockholm for three years, and and that was that was transformative. I mean, being uh, being in the field, you know, in, in a way carrying the bag, really seeing how the rubber hits the road, was not the traditional pathway for people coming out of you know headquarters marketing. But for me, it was just the grounding I needed, I think. And luckily, my wife said, yes, she would move up there. And, uh, and, and you know, we had our second kid up there. And so lots of also uh, great private experiences. But, uh, but that was a moment where it was not the logical thing to do, but it turned out to be, you know, I felt like it was the right thing that would give me a, a really different set of experiences. And I've gone on to run commercial organizations since then, and I kind of know it top to bottom now. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's a powerful thing. And then you know, I came back to run coronary marketing for Europe, launched Resolute, which is still on the market uh, uh, as the Medtronic struggle instead. And then there was a big reorg. And they basically said, well, you can go to the US, right? And, you know, take a job back in, in Minneapolis and in the headquarters, but you're going as an American and you're going to stay, right? Or you can take a big check, uh, which well, at least for me, was a big check back then. And, you know, go on your way. And I was like, well, I told myself I was going to spend two years in bid med tech and go back into startups when I came to Medtronic. I've been there eight years. And I was like, I think now's the time. This is the signal, right? And so I, uh, I looked around very quickly, was on the board of a startup, quickly joined that startup, which was called Sequana Medical. It's now public on the, on the Belgian exchange, but I was basically running commercial operations at the beginning and then clinical as well. And, uh, and really 
back in uh, the nitty gritty of building a business, which is so different from working in corporate. And I love that business. I'm always drawn to real unmet needs. I really like to go after spaces where you feel like it's in your face every day that you can change things, that there's a need. It's not just another flavor of stent or another kind of catheter. It's something real that, you know, it's challenging to introduce a new therapy. It's challenging to introduce a new way of doing things and it it often fails. But for me, that's where I felt like there was the most impact possible, but also I'm, I'm a fan in certain ways of uncertainty. And uh, it was the most questions to answer, you know, the most things to figure out. And so uh, I went up, uh, ended up three years at, uh, at Sequana Medical, and that was my transition out of Bid MedTech. And I've been in doing startups ever since. That's so. terrific. So you went from Sequana, just looking at your, uh, your LinkedIn profile now, to DirectFlow. Yeah. What was, uh, what was that sequence like? Then we'll start the LymphFlow story. I wanted to kind of get back into cardiology, where I'd spent cardiac surgery, cardiology. Sequana Medical was focused on hepatology, which was, you know, not many devices. You feel a little bit outside of the loop. Okay. And I had great connections in cardiology and, uh, you know, transcatheter valves was just kicking off right when I was leaving Medtronic, Medtronic bought core valve and things were really going. And I was approached by Bernie Lyons, in fact, uh, who was running uh, direct flow at that point. Uh, and we were about six months from CE Mark to help get the final trial done. And then to launch the product in Europe. And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, kind of carte blanche to set things up. Ended up, uh, you know, helping get the trial done and then hired 60 people, did 18 million in the first 18 months. You know, just just ran like crazy getting that technology up and running in Europe. And so a tremendous experience, hugely, huge competitive setting, uh, you know, with Edwards, obviously, and Medtronic and Boston was there with Lotus. And Sametis was there. So really dynamic setting, early stages in developing a therapy. I mean, we still had like, I remember going to the UK for my first Taver case and there was like 17 people in the room, you know? Wow. And so uh, during that period, you know, we saw it go from kind of that to two or three people in the room, right? We saw so much development in terms of technology improvement, procedure improvement, you know, just more and more sites doing it running proctoring programs. I mean, it was a fascinating, fascinating time. I really, really enjoyed that. And ultimately I became kind of the general manager for Europe. And that got me thinking about, uh, you know, can I get to into a CEO role, right? Am I ready for that? Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been kind of through fundraising a bunch of times, never run R&D, but been in charge of clinical. And then uh, just, you know, was I ready? Could I, could I convince somebody to take me on? And give me the reins a little bit. So, uh, and that ultimately uh, was that always a goal of yours, being CEO, or did it kind of slowly become one as you got deeper and deeper into running a medtech? Yeah, I would say it was. It was not a goal. Uh, I never really thought of it as that until I realized that that's where I could have the most different problems to work on. You want all the problems. I want all the problems. I want to have my fingers in everything. <laughs> and, uh, and I like to problem solve. So yeah, it, it, it came to me that that was the most logical place for me to fulfill what I find most compelling about med tech, right? But it wasn't like, I mean, I think my team would tell you, I really don't care about any of the trappings of CEO. You give me a laptop, you give me a you know, the tiniest desk in a hotel room, I'm happy and let's just get stuff done, right? But I love the work, I think. And uh, and, and that's what, uh, what's driven me to here. And I, luckily I found a couple different companies that were interested in kind of, you know, putting me in that in that position. And, uh, and Winflow was the job I took. And that was back in the summer of 2016. So, that's great. Uh, it's been just about five years now. Well, let's talk about Limflow. Let's talk about the product first, and then we can talk about the problem that you're trying to solve. What is Limflow's tech? And, and give us a little insights on its origin. Yeah, so Limflow is a, a, an interesting origin story. It actually came out with uh, Dr. Martin Rothman, who, uh, you know, British cardiologist for quite a while, was the uh, chief medical officer of Medtronic Vascular who uh, had been paying attention to a number of different things, but before he joined Medtronic, he'd seen uh, some work Josh Macauer was doing in the heart in terms of using the, the venous vasculature to provide you know, oxygenated blood to tissue, right? Which has been in the literature, surgical literature for lower limbs since about 1911. Wow. And uh, it's really difficult to do. And certainly in the heart was 
extraordinarily difficult to do, right? Uh, you're talking about really small vessels. And if something goes wrong in the heart, obviously, you suffer really uh, terrible consequences. And so Martin looked at this and said, well, it's compelling. The idea is certainly there and there's evidence in the lower limb. Why don't we try and make a purely endovascular approach to doing this in the lower limb, which is a huge unmet need. I mean, when we talk about unmet needs in cardiovascular medicine, critical limb ischemia or chronic limb threatening ischemia, CLTI as it's referred to these days, remains just a massive, massive unmet need. We're in the third decade of the 21st century, and we have hundreds of thousands of amputations going on. What is causing that restricting the blood flow? Is it uh, just a closing of, of vessels, uh, a myriad of things? What's the problem? So, I mean, usually there are two things going on. So one is you have peripheral artery disease building up of atherosclerosis and calcium and plaque in your vessels, just like you have in coronary disease, right? But if it's happening in your coronaries, it's happening everywhere. It's not heart specific, right? right the mechanism right. is in every artery, right? And lots of people survive their coronary disease today because 98, 99% of people who need a stent get a stent, right? That care is, is easy to access and, and is very effective. But what happens is that your lower limb slowly builds up with, with this blood flow. And you're also your, uh, oftentimes your microvascular system. In, in your foot is damaged because you have diabetes. So about 80% of the patients we treat have diabetes in addition to peripheral artery disease. So it's the combination often of calcium and plaque, restricting blood flow, uh, microvascular disease in the foot. And then of course, we know that diabetics are susceptible to you know, foot ulcers, right? Very many diabetics get foot ulcers. They have neuropathy. They can't feel their feet. When you get a wound, you don't know you've got it. And then once you've got it, they're very difficult to heal and they're extremely difficult to heal if you have reduced blood flow. So it's this combination of factors and comorbidities that leads ultimately to CLTI. And they're super common these days. I mean, atherosclerosis is common. Diabetes is terribly common. And as populations age, you get more and more of this because you're surviving the other things. The things we've solved, you're surviving. And when, but you have the underlying comorbidities that lead you to have CLTI eventually. Interesting. So what is your, uh, what is your solution or what are you working on that you hope will be a solution? Yeah. So what's been the problem is that we've tried to open blood vessels in the lower uh, arteries in the lower limb using technologies developed for the heart, right? So we try and, you know, balloons, stents, atherectomy. We've tried to use these things. First of all, we use them in what's called the periphery, like especially above the knee, but mm -hmm. below the knee, the vessels get smaller. You can't put stents in because you've got big muscles twisting, which will crush stents over time. You have really bad outflow. You have microvascular disease. You have super long lesions. We're talking 30 centimeter lesions, right? Wow. And we yeah. have to remember every, every millimeter, every of the 300 millimeters, every single one has to be open or blood flow doesn't get where it's supposed to go. Right. So completely different from the challenges of the coronaries where, you know, the vessels are protected from, you know, the heart beats in the same way, the ribs protect the heart from any kind of external damage happening and lesions are very short, right? So you can imagine putting a stent in there is very difficult than putting a stent in the lower calf or the foot for that matter. So there've been some successes and some work, but what we call below the knee or treating CLTI, but not many. And in fact, the FDA has not approved today any other primary therapy than plain old balloon angioplasty, right? Which is a 1980s idea, right? And atherectomy. So, you know, we don't, we have no covered stents, no bare metal stents, no drug eluding stents, no drug coated balloons, nothing, right? So you're either so pushing really, the vessels, pushing the vessels open or you're kind of churning up you're, the... You're, the, yeah, you're just pushing the vessels open or churning things up. And when you're yeah. churning things up, that doesn't really solve the problem uh, yeah. long term. So uh, so what you have is just, and the FDA wants to approve things, but it's been very difficult to prove efficacy. So what, what we did is we looked at that and said, well, actually, the literature is pretty clear. There are a bunch of patients who don't respond to therapy. It's 25 to 35% just don't respond to any vascular therapy. And there's actually about... 15% of patients who can't get any therapy. These are what we call no option patients. So they are explicitly cannot get any further endovascular or surgical treatment. So they're too far advanced to treat. And we can reflect back 
as we've seen this in similar populations in TAVR, we had the extreme risk patient population, right? Where surgeons said, not gonna operate, right? We can't do anything for you. You're gonna die of your aerostromosis. The, these, are, these are our equivalent patients in CLTI. These are patients where if you can't get a wire up it, you can't get a wire down it, you can't open anything up. And if the surgeons say there's nothing to sew a bypass to, right? They're going to take mm -hmm. your leg off. Okay. So this is a patient group that at the end of one year is going to have a sub 20% amputation-free survival. So over 80% of them are going to be dead or amputated at one year. Wow. And if you're amputated, you're going to go through a whole second set of challenges because having a major lower limb amputation is worse than basically any except the most aggressive pancreatic and lung cancers. So you're talking about five-year mortality that's just minuscule. So you really don't want to have a major lower limb amputation, right? And you really don't want to be in the category of the untreatable, the no option. So we said, we got this idea. It's a pretty crazy idea. It runs counter to kind of page two of the anatomy textbook, right? Because we know arteries take blood from the heart to the tissue, right? And veins take blood from the body back to the heart. That's the way things work, right? And you don't have calcium and plaque in the arteries. You, you have it in the arteries, but you don't have it in the veins. Veins have different diseases. So we know that there is a pathway there, the veins, which run right alongside the arteries, but perhaps we can cross over into the, the veins and use those veins to deliver blood flow to the foot. So accept that the arteries are not going to be able to provide blood flow anymore and use the veins instead. And that's the principle of limp flow. The best analogy is you're driving to the airport and you get stuck on the highway and you know Waze tells you you're going to get there tomorrow right so you're not going to make your flight right and you look across the media and say well, wait a minute that road on the other side of the meeting goes to the airport right it runs in the wrong direction but it goes where i want to go and if you can cross over just like in if you live in the south hurricanes right they open up the other side of the highway to evacuate everybody same principle if you could cross over the meeting and use that way to get where you want to go maybe that's a solution. So we actually, that's what Limplo does, is it we place covered stents from an artery into the vein and down to the ankle. So we're channeling arterial red oxygenated blood into the vein and down past the ankle into the deep tissue of the foot. We use a valvular tone to knock all the valves out, which keep blood from running in the wrong direction. And we allow that arterial blood to pressurize and perfuse the deep tissue foot, heal the foot, because all these patients that we treat have wounds and take the patient off the pathway to amputation. That's our goal. And that's what we do. So how does the blood find its way back to the heart? It just uses another, another roadway? Yeah. I mean, we use one, only one vein and yeah. you typically have uh, more than one vein for every artery. So, uh, and we're just using one of several large veins that support that, that take blood back from the foot. So uh, we're not really using up the, uh, the full capacity in any way. So our goal from the very beginning at, at, uh, at Limplo has been, let's develop a suite of tools that we can use to do this procedure and planable and tools that we use to do the procedure. Let's develop the procedure so we understand how to do it, where's the access, which steps do we do, how do we make it happen, how do we use imaging, uh, ultrasound or fluoroscopy so that we can essentially accomplish the procedure. And then how do we care for the patient afterwards? because we are changing the biology of the patient in a way. We are repurposing the arteries and the veins, right, for a, a different task. So all of that has been done over the past five years. So we developed a set of covered stents, conical and straight covered stent grafts to allow us to perform this procedure. We have a, a unique push valvulatome, and we have a system for crossing from artery to vein. And so all those pieces are the limb flow system, right? and the limb flow procedure, and it's something called percutaneous deep vein arterialization. But the impact of that has been incredible. We've taken patients that were absolutely headed for amputation and been able to heal them. And we've been proving that in clinical trials. We ran a clinical trial outside the United States called ALPS. We did an early feasibility study in the US called PROMISE-1. And we are going to complete enrollment in PROMISE-2 in the next few weeks, which is our pivotal trial which will, uh, if, you know, it's a PMA filing in front of the FDA, and that will help us obtain approval, we think, hope we're targeting middle of next year. And the excitement in the community is, is incredible about what we're doing.
Two questions. You mentioned earlier the challenge of putting a stent in the leg because it can be the muscles down there, it could be knocked around. How do you ensure your stents can withstand whatever is going on down there? Yeah. So we use uh we use self-expanding stents. So we, rather than using, uh, you know, cobalt chromium or, or uh, you know, balloon expandable stents. So self-expanding stents can, you know, once they're squeezed, can expand again. So they tend to do better in those uh, in those situations. And there's a good history of that. So yeah, we, we've had success keeping those, uh, those stents open. They're also placed in a vein, which is a little bit different than being placed in an artery. They're not as constrained as they are in an arterial setting. And who are you selling to? What are the specialists that you, you, you target? And what is that market like? Are they built for something like this to do what you're designing for them? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, lower limb disease is an interesting one, right? It, historically, it's been the uh, area of the vascular surgeon who, again, as, as a surgeon, right? So they're trained mostly to do surgical interventions, but have increasingly, and now many vascular surgeons spend most of their time doing endovascular procedures, which is very interesting. But there are also a fair number of interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists who do lower limb work. So uh, there are actually three different disciplines involved in doing lower limb treatments. And, uh, and we work with all three of them. And we've tried to build a system. I mean, part of innovation, right, is not just, or successful innovation, it's not just building something that could be done by the best of the best, right, but building something that's adoptable, teachable, reproducible by, you know, your kind of average operator, right? Because we all know there are brilliant people out there who can do almost anything if you give them a catheter, right? Yeah, sure. Or, or a scalpel. I mean, they're just, uh, I mean, I've had the privilege of working with a, a bunch of them and they're incredible, but that's not who you build technology, right? Mm-hmm. Technology has to work in the hand of the average guy. And so we've been, we've been focused on that, making sure that we had kit that kind of anyone who was doing basic lower limb work could ultimately adopt. And uh, that's been a challenge because it's not, limb flow is not one stent in one bag in one box. You know, I mean, it, I, my life would be so much easier if it were, but it's not. Right, right. right. So, uh, so we have, we have a lot of um, procedural development and technology development that's going on to getting us where, where, where we are today. Terrific. And final question. You mentioned the fun of fundraising before. Curious, where are you with, with that? Are you going to be raising money again? And, and kind of along those lines, what do you see the future of this company being? Is this something that do you already have some potential acquirers in mind where this would fit into someone else's bigger bag? What does the future look like if, if all goes well in the trials? Uh, we expect to close by the end of the month on our Series D. So that's, okay. that's done largely oversubscribed. Uh, it was actually the easiest round I've ever raised. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, just a, a lot of excitement and interest because, you know, people have been tracking us for a long time. I think when people say, hey, these guys came to me two or three years ago, said they were going to do this. They went away. They did that. And now they're back. Right. I mean, I think that's that's what in many ways what investors are, are looking for is not just someone who shows up the doorstep and makes promises, but someone they tracked and said, this team delivers, right? Mm. That was very helpful. And that will take us through, uh, you know, the first year, year and a bit of commercialization. So billing, allowing us to ramp up and do everything we need to do both in the US and Europe. And we actually have work going on in Japan as well. So, uh, and then what happens with the company? I mean, who can tell? We're in it for the business, right? We're in it for the patients. We have a really strong mission inside the company of what we call no limb left behind. Right, we are very focused on developing the therapy and getting to the people who need it most. And if someone comes and taps us on the shoulder, and people talk to us all the time in that context, then that's something our shareholders have to make a decision about. Right, sure. but yeah. uh, but in the meantime, we know what we need to do, and we're loving doing it. You know, uh, and I think uh, you can't ask for more than that. And so we'll see. We'll see what happens over the next few years. I think we there's a lot of ways that we make sense uh, in an M&A perspective, but also I think the pathway is very clear to being a public company. I mean, we've seen incredible stories on that front. I mean, you can only look at Shockwave and Sophie Nova is one of our investors and they were one of the lead investors in Shockwave. We've seen Inari, we've seen Penumbra, we've seen mm-hmm. you know Silk Road, we've seen just again and again. And we have to remember that no strategic bought them. That's right. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it happens or it doesn't happen, but you build your company. And you get to the patients and, and you, you make sure they do well. That's what we can stay focused on. Excellent. Well, it's a, it's a great story. And uh, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. 
I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Daniel Rose. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, I interviewed Dan in March. They did close in their round. They raised $40 million, 36 million euros of an oversubscribed Series D. Investors, new investors included Longitude, Soleus Capital Management, and an undisclosed strategic investor. Past investors or previous investors include Sofanova Partners through its crossover strategy fund, BPI France, the French Sovereign Investment Bank, and Ballester, a Singaporean family fund. Now we'll pick up number three on the New Markers Newsmakers. Number three on the list, we've got uh, Archimed Group uh, acquiring Natus Medical for $1.2 billion. So that's a nice big, uh, nice big uh, M&A deal, um, you know, going down, you know, with uh, in, in, in the process, uh, you know, taking the uh, taking the co- company private after this deal. So Wow. So Natus is going private. I didn't realize that... Uh... I haven't seen one of those deals in, in, in a while, and it, it's interesting, huh? Yeah, I mean, we've we've seen quite the the opposite with the SPACs. Uh, so I guess this is a things have been sagging a bit on the public markets. Sure, uh, perhaps this is uh, something we'll see more of going forward. You know, we could. I mean, we're seeing. Um, yeah, you know, we're also seeing uh, more spinoff deals. Um, you know, they're actually just today, uh, our MDO managing editor, Jim Hamran, he had an article off of Moody's report. And one of the points that Moody's was saying was that there might be, um, you know, some more reluctance to do M&A deals because the uh, federal government, one of the things they're doing to try to control inflation is they're really scrutinizing M&A deals a lot more to see if there's like any antitrust implications. So, you know, I, so there might be something here where companies don't want to, you don't want to do that big M&A deal because you're just going to, because the feds are just going to be like, you know, it's, it's, it's just going to be too much that, you know, how, how much this is going to be scrutinized, you know, um, as, as you're going through that. And, the, you know, the Moody story actually, uh, you know, and the same thing's going on in Europe as well. But, um, you know, they were, they were, the Moody's report was mentioning the whole Lumina Grail deal, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and how that's, uh, you know, run a lot of trouble with the, in the EU. So, so, yeah, maybe there's some headwinds on doing M&A. You just, you know, because we're, the government's taking a stronger antitrust stance. That's an interesting Get point. Some competition yeah, going. That's an interesting point. And I, I mean, we, we had um, Medtronic bought. Oh, uh, Intersect, ENT. And we have, that hasn't closed yeah. yet, right? Or closed. I, I remember the regular, it was being held up, I think, by regulators or by, by you know, just concerns over, over control of the market. But, Medtronic said to be, yeah, they've they've been, yeah, they've been going through a. Uh, yeah, they announced it last they had August. A timing agreement, timing agreement with the FTC. So they're reportedly planning to. Yeah, it looks like they're reportedly planning to finally get this closed. But they, uh, yeah, they took a while. They had a. We talked to Jeff yeah. Jeff Martha on the podcast last fall, and he said it was a SEC thing, and then and same situation. So yeah, it'll be interesting if if more of these deals get caught up. Uh, the- yeah, if we get more FTC scrutiny, you know, maybe you just don't want to do some of these deals yep. going forward. All right, at least for now. Let us move on to number two on the new Marcus Newsmakers. Well, number two on the list, I'm, I'm you know, talking about Jim Hammer, and he had a really, uh, really good get of an interview. He uh, talked to uh, uh, Dr. Taha Kass Hout, and he's the chief medical officer at uh, Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, you know, he's talking about all the you know things he sees the uh, you know cloud cloud computing uh, you know doing to uh, you know boost uh, medtech innovation. So just a really uh, really interesting interview. I mean, he's got a lot of insight too because he uh, you know you know served at, in the FDA uh, during the Obama administration as well hmm. as like a, a chief health informatics officer. So I mean, he uh, yeah, I mean, he was just uh, so many of these advances that we're seeing now. You know, thanks to like the fact that you can do cloud computing that you can I mean, he, was, he was talking about um you know moderna like about how basically that company was born on the cloud you know when they were founded you know and that they you know kind of have this like mrna platform that's now like you know coming out with all these different types of treatments and of course the you know the vaccine that you know like so many of us have uh, have received you know so um so yeah really really cool and he listed up of off a bunch of companies that have been you know benefiting from the uh, the cloud the co- companies that uh you know we cover for like you know the butterfly network so yeah he's been doing a great job with that i mean he was the first to have johnson and johnson's uh two two uh executives on uh to talk about their deal with uh microsoft and now jim has been he's got a great series going on maybe we need to get some cloud theme music for yeah. jim but uh i'd love to build this into cloud music i, I don't want to look too far <laughs> ahead but i need to I'd love to build this into some sort of panel for Device Talks West, which is happening on October 9th, October 19th and 20th. But be awesome. I'll worry about that June 8th after Device Talks Minnesota. So 
And I just say that we um, actually, as after I get off this, I'm going to be editing Jim's like big feature he wrote for the uh, May print edition of uh, Medical Design Outsourcing. That's including like insights from all these you know different people he's uh, he's interviewed you know over uh, over the last month or so. So that'll be a really good spread to, to check out in that uh, in that print edition that's just coming out. Uh, that should be out in time. That we'll have some stacks of it uh, at uh, Device Talks Boston. Fantastic. So. And I got to meet Jim last week at MDNM West. So it's good to actually finally yeah. finally meet a colleague. We are meeting each other in person. Meeting again. each other in person. It was outstanding. We had a nice dinner together with uh, Brian Tool, our other colleague. So I enjoyed splitting a nice plate of poutine with you at uh, at Brit's Pub, like during MDN in Minneapolis. That was That's good. what we'll that was get at Device Talks Minnesota. They, mm. What is the world's largest? poutine plate we have to break that record we need to get the get oh, a little record no <laughs> okay keep a defibrillator around somewhere <laughs> we can get one we know people <laughs> we know people hmm, who here would, might have a defibrillator around we are contacts in the industry <laughs> well, well, yeah yeah bring a defibrillator before chris and tom eat a massive platter <laughs> of fries cheese curves gravy <laughs> oh you're getting you're making me hungry all right oh, let us all right. roll on to number one of the new markers newsmakers all all right, number one on the list. Oh, it always gets interesting when we do these on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, All right, number actually number one on the list. This was uh, this was a bit of a surprise. Uh, Dense play uh, C Serona. Um, they uh, they uh, sacked their CEO, let him go. So they uh, Don Casey. Can you give any details as to why? Or you know, they didn't give a reason um, in the announcement. Um, though it's you know it's sometimes interesting with these things what they don't say i mean i mean they it's 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 notable that the board chair did you know say some nice things about um about casey and the news release and they um they also um you know they also at the same time that they um you know released uh, some preliminary q1 numbers that were not meeting expectations so you know that you, know, you can kind of read between the the lines there mm. and they um, brought in as their interim CEO uh, one of their board members. The uh, f- you know the uh, former CEO of Hillrom is uh, taking over as their interim C- CEO. He's bringing the former CFO of Hillrom over to be their interim CFO. Oh, I see. Since their CFO, yeah. I'm reading Sean Hooley's article that was on drug discovery yeah. and development that Jorge Gomez left. Yeah, where he's leaving for Moderna for, Moderna, for so CFO the, position so the, Moderna. So yeah, so the CFO was leaving. Now they've let go of the CEO. And, you know, they've got, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, people who, you know, were running Hillrom coming into running to run the company on the interim. Um, you know, Hillrom just got acquired by Baxter. So, so they, uh, so these, you know, former Hillrom leaders, you know, they, they have some time to look at, at the very least, you know, run Dense Place Serona on the, on the interim. And, uh, you know, it said something too, like the interim C- CEO, like John, um, see if I can pronounce this right. Grotelaires. Uh, you were going to do it. All right. I was thought you were going to work your way around it, but yes, that's my guess as well. Yes. It looks like he, uh, you know, he said that, um, you know, the, the board, you know, wanting a, a focus on stabilizing the business and delivering strong performance despite, you know, macroeconomic challenges. That, that seems really, to me, that that seems like kind of a key quote there about like what what's going on over there. So, right. I mean, you, you always have a lot of questions when you see something like that, you know, go down when, a, you know, a company... Um, you know, let's let's go of a, a CEO on, on short notice like that. But um, yeah, the, it seems like a lot of, a lot of that news release was just about performance, about company performance, and maybe they want to. But we'll see if any more information comes out. Maybe they just you know needed a change there. All right, well, good list, Chris Newmarker. Hey, I do my best. We're cranking out the news here. Now I'd like to bring back Christine Trepigny. She is the Chief Technology Officer of Confluent Medical. Christine, tell me. How does Confluent work with medical device companies? So we start engaging our customers early on during design and development activities. We can support our customers with design optimization using computational simulation as well as bench shop testing. In addition to that, we also offer um, turn prototyping so our customers can quickly iterate to various designs until they get to a design freeze. Once a design is selected, we move to what we consider a development and optimization phase where the focus is set on development of tools and processes that are robust capable and scalable in preparation for moving into large-scale manufacturing. Fantastic. We'll run the rest of my interview with Christine Trepigny a little later in the podcast. Well, Doug Gutschall, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Tom. 
I'm eager to learn more about Shockwave Medical, although I watched the very informative video, uh, cartoon video on your website about its origins with John Adams and Dan Hawkins and it's really great explainer and the video after also. Good bit of uh, communications from Shockwave. So folks, I'll have the links in the show notes, but uh, definitely a great way to find out more about the company. We're going to explore the space that you're in, but before we do that, I'd love to first, Doug, find out a bit about you and how you found your way into the medtech industry. What, was, uh, what drove you to join this industry? Yeah, I took a bit of a circuitous path relative to, to, to most people. Those are my favorite. So I was a uh, late bloomer to medtech, I guess, to some extent. I uh, Out of college, I started out in advertising and great experience to sort of see one side of marketing, but I pre- pretty quickly realized I don't, I don't like doing direct mail, which is what I spent a lot of time doing back then. Got to look at a lot of different businesses because they were my clients, but none of them really attracted me. But one thing that I had done in college, I sold t-shirts door to door in school. A friend and I had designed them. So I sort of revisited that uh, post advertising and spent a couple of years designing and selling women's garments, starting with t-shirts. And then we ended up getting into <laughs> uh, dresses and turtlenecks and various other things. But uh, many of the listeners probably either weren't working or don't remember this little recession we had in uh, 88, 89. And, and suddenly my customers, we had a couple hundred customers, these little boutiques started going bankrupt and not paying their bills. And that was problematic when our company was basically funded on $5,000 of savings that I had. And so my partner and I decided maybe we should do it. We should go do something else. So we sold off our inventory and I, I ended up with more than $5,000. So I would call it a success. And Good thought, effort, sure. Yeah, and thought maybe I should like go get a job where somebody else pays my bills and my health insurance, and and I'll I'll learn from a real company, and then go start my own thing again. This is it. I'm I'm staring at your LinkedIn profile, VP Business Development, Boston Scientific, in the year two, the year 2000, and I can't wait to hear how <laughs> how we got there yeah. in these 10 years. So please yeah. continue. So luckily. One of my dad's good friends worked at Boston Scientific at a fairly senior level. So I sent him my resume and said, okay, I just sold women's garments and I want to get into med tech because I'd like to be in a sort of more recession resistant business, yeah. uh, having, having just su- suffered the consequences and sort of looking at the sort of the dynamics of societies around the world, like healthcare seemed like a pretty good place to go. It, it also seemed a lot more sophisticated than, than going into boutique stores and having someone say, oh, you know, you know your, your color palette doesn't match our color palette. And so I'm not going to buy the clothing from you. I thought I'd like to take a little step up in terms of the sophistication of the folks that I'm working with on a daily basis. No disrespect to the rag trade. It's great. People love it. We all need clothes, but it wasn't <laughs> really, I didn't see myself doing it forever. So by just dumb luck, when I sent my resume to uh, to my dad's friend and said, okay, what's the next job I should take so that somebody like you would hire me? He passed my resume to somebody and suddenly I was interviewing for a job at Boston Scientific. And that's a good so, question though. That's a good question. <laughs> what, what is the next job? I should, yeah, that's a good yeah, way to yeah, put it. So, yeah. uh, so the next job I had was uh, what we called a territory floater because they weren't really sure if I could actually sell anything since all I sold were t-shirts and dresses previously. So I was I took the job. I was I was based in Philadelphia, and then after I accepted the job, they said, "No, you're not. You're based in Chicago." And then partway through my training, they said, "Actually, Milwaukee." So I lived in Milwaukee for for a better part of a year back in 1990, and then they gave me a sort of a real territory because I proved that I could actually sell something and uh, spent some time in Baltimore. Uh, ultimately, my goal was to learn the business through selling, but with the objective of of getting into marketing because as I sort of looked at what I liked about my clothing experience and my advertising experience, you know, marketing seemed like the path that I should go in. And ultimately, if I wanted to run my own business, sort of start with selling and marketing, uh, and that would improve my chances of success. What business were you selling? I started out in, in urology and GI, which was a combined business unit. I was the, I think the 18th salesperson okay. um, hired in that combined business. And we, BSC at the time had 150 million in sales and 650 employees. So kind of a small company pre-IPO. And I stayed in urology marketing, then moved into business development in 2000. So then if you remember back then, BSC was incredibly prolific at uh, transactions. I, I did about 75 transactions in five years. Wow. Uh, which was, yeah, was a lot. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was a lot. 
I was supporting the cardiovascular business, uh, the the neurovascular business, uh, vascular surgery. So I went. I had no knowledge of the cardiovascular world, but but Larry Best, the CFO at the time, didn't want me to do deals in GI and neurology because he thinks I, he thought I would have too many preconceived notions about what we should do, and he wanted the business unit to make those decisions. So he put me into a space that I knew nothing about in in, uh, in interventional cardiology, and and at the time, drug eluting stents and everything was going on. So obviously, it's still going on now, but back then it was we were gobbling up as many patents and drugs and coatings and and the like, in addition to not just licenses, but we did a lot of acquisitions as well. So you learn a lot. You learn a lot about strategy, obviously. You learn a lot about management teams because you're, we, we, I probably met with 700, 800 good companies in that, uh, in that time frame, And so you start to do a little bit of pattern recognition of sort of what companies work, what companies work, don't work. Nobody can make a bad technology work, but a bad management team can kill a good technology. And then as I transitioned from that BD role into running one of the business units, uh, vascular surgery business, we acquired Trivascular, uh, the first version of Trivascular. Right. I didn't really want to do that deal. I got overridden by our CEO at the time. So I had the um, unenviable task of acquiring, integrating, and running that business, and then I set the record for the biggest layoff in BSE's history at the time. I think it was like 350 people in a day oh. in, three, in three different locations. And I thought you were talking about your your position. Uh, <laughs> well, I use that as my sort of, okay, I have now, I've learned how to do something I never, ever, ever want to do again Yeah, in, in that layoff. But it also gave, I sort of stepped back and said, okay, if I would have done things differently than I was forced to do, basically, to do that acquisition. So if I'm so smart, maybe I ought to go prove it. And it's now time to go run something uh, on my own. And luckily, I just happened upon an opportunity with hardware, which was fairly risk laden. We had only treated two patients or they had only treated two patients. They didn't know how to manufacture the device. They had a a six months in a row of 0% yield. And having watched I learned a lot during the trivascular phase because they also had a lot of yield issues. So even though I'm not a manufacturing person, at least I kind of thought I might be able to figure it out. And first time CEOs, like you're not going to get the easy job as your, as, right. your first, as your first gig because like the easy jobs will go to somebody who has already done it before. Um, and it was so, an incredible, incredible experience at hardware. Uh, a lot of ups and downs, but we saved a lot of patients' lives. And, and unfortunately, Medtronic shut the business down last year, but... Uh, we did a lot of good during our time there. I was curious about that, and I, I want to just circle back for a moment. I just your your path is uh, certainly circuitous, and 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 clearly was not what you had designed initially. And it seems to be the path that I think younger people sort of follow these days. You no longer have to have your whole life mapped out when you're 22, like I felt like I needed to do when I was that age. What kind of advice do you glean from your experience that you you followed? I mean, you went from selling clothes to selling urology products to Buying companies and then leading companies again without, I don't think in, two, in 1990, you said, I want to be a CEO of a startup in 2006. What, what kind of advice do you draw from your own experience? Maybe you, you tell your kids or, or tell younger people in the industry. Well, well, I've learned not to give my kids too much advice because then they might, <laughs> they might just do the opposite. <laughs> Why would I, what is my good, dad? that's good parental advice that's a good point yeah <laughs> let's go uh, on career, career advice yeah yeah you have to you have to be more creative when giving your children advice uh, <laughs> it doesn't feel like you're giving them advice i sort of got the bug of, of running my own thing uh pretty strongly when i when i did that clothing business i certainly also learned i'm really not that good at things like bookkeeping, financials, and and I couldn't hire people because we had no money. But it was also self-evident that if and when I do my own thing again, I got to be pretty thoughtful about finding people who have complementary skills to the one that I have, the ones that I have, because I'm I'm just not smart enough or talented enough to do everybody's job for them. In that super small company, I essentially was doing everything other than designing the clothing and not the things I learned a lot. And I certainly learned, I like the customer interaction. I like the building process. So I knew I wanted to go do my own thing. I, 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 I didn't, certainly you're right. In 1990, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to go in the next six or 16 years from now, I'm going to be a CEO of a, of a small med tech company. 
but I did know that once I kind of got into it, you know, I, I think I would like to be a general manager at BSC if I can figure out a way to do that. I like the sort of having broad cross-functional responsibility. And as I sort of charted what are the collection of experiences that would, would be valuable, I, there were certain things back then, like in that phase of BSC, you went from sales to marketing, and then you're supposed to go back out into sales leadership, and then you're supposed to go and take an international role. And sort of they had, there was a semi-standard path that allegedly you're supposed to take if you wanted to, to move up. And, and as I looked at it, I thought there were, I was particularly intrigued by BD because I, my favorite part of marketing and, and even being in sales, my favorite part was the strategy component. And BD struck me as like that when I watched what those folks did, man, that must be sort of outside looking in. That looks really interesting because you have a, you, could, you have an outsized impact on the company and it's, and it's really a, a lot about how, how do you get the puzzle pieces to fit together to find assets that fit the strategy or influence the strategy to the company through M&A. But there was not, I didn't have the sort of direct, I didn't have every step of the path mapped out exactly, but there were certain things that struck me that to build on my career, even though some of the, some of the steps like going from director of marketing to initially a director of BD was a lateral move, but it was a substantial change in skills and experiences. So see, it felt like that's a big step forward, even though it's, um, it's quasi sideways move. I looked at sort of different stops along the way in terms of what am I, what am I going to learn and how I'm going to make myself more, more valuable and ultimately put myself in a position where I, I, I kind of know I have this genetic defect that makes me want to run things so, <laughs> and be accountable and responsible. So how do I give myself the best chance of being successful as I'm playing out and fulfilling this genetic issue that I have with, <laughs> with being the sort of person in charge of the team. And so sometimes it was a right place, right time. And I just got lucky that somebody left a role and they needed somebody to fulfill it. Other times it was more, I had my, I knew, and this is the path I want to go down. I just got to figure out how to convince people to let me do it. That makes sense. So talking about the hardware for a moment, because I don't want to spend too much time because I didn't want to get into Shockwave because as I said at the top, it's a super cool company. But what was that experience like? And and you mentioned uh, Medtronic's decision to shut it down last year. I just, I, I was wondering how, how you felt about that and how that sort of, you know, you spend a good part of your life working on something and, and to have that be the outcome. I wonder how that sort of hit you. Yeah, it was, I can't quibble with their with their decisions. I don't have all the the facts that they have as they, sure. they had to weigh that decision. For anyone who has worked in the ventricular assist space, and it's sort of a small segment of the med tech space, but it's the, arguably it's the most clinically intense product you could be involved with. It's called an assist device, but it really becomes yeah. a survival device. Once the, once the patient's on an LVAD for a little while and it's not long, they become dependent on it. If your pump stops, the patient more likely than not is going to die, which is a, it's sort of an honor to be in a position to keep a patient alive. It's also oppressive because every day by the time Medtronic bought us, we had thousands of thousands of patients on, on our device 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it almost always works, but sometimes it doesn't. Most of the patients, if not all the patients end up with some sort of a, an adverse event at some juncture along their clinical course. You feel this incredible duty to those patients to do everything you can to make the device as safe as you possibly can, but the development cycle is incredibly long. And even after you have tested and tested and tested the device, as we did with our second generation product, I mean, we, we probably did a hundred preclinical studies. And I've never been involved with a device that was tested as rigorously as that was. And we, we delayed entering the clinic with it over and over again, because we kept thinking it's not quite right. We found something in the testing that suggested we've got to, we have one more fix to make and then we'll get in the clinic. And we finally got in the clinic and after 11 patients, it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, it worked, but we were getting thrombus in the pump at a rate that was not tolerable. And that was at 11 patients. We couldn't go to 400 patients when we already saw the issue. So we went back to the drawing board to redesign uh, that product that we called the embed. When we stopped the study, our stock price dropped in half. 
we became affordable for, for Medtronic. So the day that I the day that I announced that we were stopping the study and got yelled at by investors for about 72 straight hours at the JP Morgan conference back in 2016. Medtronic took that same three days to sort of put pen to paper and figure out is is it now time to add hardware to our our heart failure portfolio. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were quite we became quite bullish about the progress we were making on on uh, fixing quote unquote our uh, the pump. So we thought we had pretty clear line of sight to eliminate that thrombus issue when Medtronic showed up and made an offer. And we went back and forth a bit on that offer and improved it to a level where if somebody's offering you twice as much as your share price, even if the share price is lower than it used to be, it's a big risk for a board to say no. Right. And as much as we thought we had a solution in hand, it kind of you kind of had to say yes, because there was no guarantee that we were going to get there, even though we thought we would. So Medtronic over time, they ended up not pursuing the improvements that we had on that pump. Uh, they pursued more work on the electronics, as I understand it. Ultimately, the thing you've got to have that is better than your competitors in that space is a better pump. And, and the Harmony 3 from Abbott, which was started out at, uh, at Thoratech, did a better job at lowering certain adverse events that our first generation pump, the HVAD, that, uh, that, Met that Medtronic acquired we were winning commercially because we had lower adverse events. Their next generation pump had lower adverse events than we did, and or, or Medtronic did, and and so that seems to be their their motivation for changing. And to some extent, it's hard to sell a product that is. I would have had a hard time continuing to sell our product if you look and just say it is fundamentally less safe than the other device. When it is a life saving device, you, ethically, it would have been hard to keep selling it. So I don't. I don't know that I would have made a different decision than they made, other than I would have kept working on on the pump, at least based on what I know. We thought we thought I had a better chance, but shock. I wake up feeling much more comfortable and I sleep better at Shockwave than I did at Hardware because I went from the most clinically intense and very high adverse event product to one that is perhaps the safest device I've ever been associated with. At That's Shockwave. true. So. You're right. The stakes are high in med tech. I think no matter what you work on, but but I think they're highest in, in in the pump area where you have to keep running and keep to keep people alive. So you understand the decision with, with hardware, and I don't want to harp on it, but I just speaking to med tech is an industry where you can work hard at something and it just doesn't work out. I just kind of wonder what is that feeling that when that happens. I imagine there's a level of disappointment, or is it just sort of that's the way it goes. Understanding and and you move on. You know, we had an incredibly talented and engaged team at, at Hardware, and yep. uh, and there was sort of a universal sadness. We're not together anymore. Obviously, we post acquisition doesn't make much sense for the former CEO to stick around because I would have still done what I wanted to do, and Medtronic would, wouldn't have wanted to do what I wanted to do. Right. Um, so there was a lot of texts and emails that flew around when the, when they decided to shut it down. That was. I don't know that they were right or they were wrong. And I don't know that I would have done anything differently than they did, given the facts that they had in front of them in 2021. But we also know that we saved a lot of patients' lives over that decade. And even though we were obsessed with lowering the adverse event rate, even though our, our rate was really nice and low initially relative to the alternatives, the patients were the most grateful human beings I've ever met because they were told by their doctor, you have a couple of weeks to live. And then we used to have this patient summit at our facility and, and the patients and their spouses would come by and they were so, so, so thankful. Like you just gave me three more years with my wife. And there are very few devices. I mean, there are obviously insulin pumps and like where the patient has direct interaction with, with that product, but multiple times every day, patients were unplugging and, and replugging in batteries for their hardware device. And so you are, they are constantly aware that you're keeping them alive and, right. and have a very close association with that, with the company that is doing that for them. So it's, it's a humbling, gratifying experience. That's a great uh, point. No, that's a great, that's a great perspective. It must be amazing to hear that, but let's get into shockwave. Cause this is a, as I mentioned at the top, there's a, a video that sort of talks about its origins, a med tech incubator with Dan Hawkins. We've had the podcast before and John Adams. You were not there at the beginning, but if you could just sort of give the origin of the technology a bit and talk a bit about Shockwave's approach. Yeah. So John 
Daniel and then later joined by Todd Brinton, mm-hmm. uh, the cardiologist from Stanford now at Edwards. They were looking for sort of what's our, what should we do sort of incubator kind of activity and landed on cardiovascular calcium, no good solutions, hardest patients to treat for cardiologists tend to be the ones who are and vascular surgeons and radiologists tend to be these patients with severe calcium. I don't know which one of them, Dan or John, came up with the, hey, what if we reversed the extracorporeal lithotripsy concept for urology and made it intracorporeal and put it in a balloon catheter so it could be in close proximity to to where the calcium is in the the vessel. So uh, certainly John, who's just a wonderful man, he was the sort of technical wizard who figured out how to make it work. I think there were lots of skeptics, as there often is with something that's that, that is that revolutionary as a concept. Uh, you're taking sort of super high-powered external lithotripsy conceptually that everybody knows about to break up kidney stones, and now we're going to downsize it and put it next to the next to the calcium in the artery. And yet they were really effective at, at sort of doing the iterative, innovative problem-solving activities that landed on this form factor, which is very similar to what we sell sell today, which is these series of emitters and inside of a balloon and came up with the innovation of how to, how to skip emitters so that you can have pulses traverse through the length of the balloon so that you, you get sort of a field effect of lithotripsy along the length, sort of a long treatment zone versus something like a laser, which you get the energy at the tip or electrohydraulic probes for, for ureteral stones in, in urology, energies at the tip, but energy at the tip, that also means like you've got a long time to treat and you can't tr- have this field effect that, that they created by, uh, by having this, this series of electrodes inside of a balloon. And so tremendous innovation. And, and for guys, guys like me, who like, I think my role is the next CEO I'm not an inventor like John. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I, so I need inventors like John to figure it out so that they create companies with Daniel that I can then help finish. Cause I think that's sort of, that seems to be my, my shtick and it's hard. There are very few entrepreneurs who can take a company from scratch to IPO. And so understanding sort of what's your, what your sweet spot is and what you're, what you're good at and what you're not good at. I think I'm not good at, tinkering in a lab and breaking eggshells like John and Ed, John and Daniel did. <laughs> and that and was a, literally breaking eggshells. It's not a, it's not a metaphor. You were, yeah. yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, and that was, I think that was their, well, I know that was their Eureka moment. We exactly. Two, yeah. I was, talk, I was talking to Ziad Ali, who's a cardiologist in New York. He was also in the lab with Todd and Daniel and, and John. And I was just talking to him two days ago and he was recounting the, he's like, I, he's like, I thought, I think I bought the eggs at Safeway. John thinks, <laughs> John thinks he brought the eggs with him from Seattle. I, uh, so, but that was the, oh my gosh, this thing is going to work for, that was their moment. But there were a lot of people who didn't believe, like when I, even when I first started here in May of 2017, doctors were still saying things like, oh, you're with that wiggly balloon company. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that's going to work. And so we, 2017 was a, there was a significant wall of skepticism about sort of what, why do I need this device? Why would I pay for this device? I'm perfectly fine with the tools that I have. We were very fortunate that we had sort of, we found the early adopter kind of docs who say, yeah, I'll give it a try. Or they knew one of our reps and they were like, okay, fine. You've been good to me in the past. I'll give it a try. And then and then we started a trial, and I think the trial was one of the critical pieces that got us rolling because academic centers want to be in trials, and even if they're not so sure the device works, they'll give it a try because they get to be in a study. And once they once they start using it and using it more and using it more, like, huh, this thing's pretty amazing. It actually does work. When you were talking earlier about your being the second CEO, it, you almost sort of discounted, at least that I was hearing, like, look, this was already sort of a done deal. I just sort of had a lead the company as it as it continued to find success. But as you explained it, there was still, as you said, a lot of uncertainty. And yeah, the video talks about, I think they presented to investors for over a year before they found some their initial capital. And then to go from from uncertainty in 2016 to another video that you have on the website, which you have doctors who are just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. How did you overcome that? Well, first of all, what was it about the story that appealed to you? If it wasn't like, this is definitely going to work, why did you decide to hitch your, your wagon to this train? 
Now I'd like to bring in the final portion of my interview with Christine Chepigny, the Chief Technology Officer at Confluent Medical. Christine, where do you see your business headed in the future? So for Confluent, I think building on the other question uh, that you ask about who we are, our future is really about adding new capabilities to better serve our customers. To give you an example, we recently launched a precision polymer tubing facility that can provide PTFE liners and poly image tubing to our customers. Uh, we also strive to continue to reduce our lead times to also better serve our service our customers. Again, building on the same capabilities for precision tubing, we offer four week lead time to our customers for precision tubing compared to a 26 to 52 week lead time uh, that our competitors are, are offering to our customers. We also want to provide our customers with a suite of capabilities uh, and that's where we see ourselves headed in the future is really continuously adding to our, our technologies and the, the capabilities we already have. Uh, so we we can be not just a single service provider, but really be uh, the provider that can provide several services to our customers. That's great. And finally, I understand you have some news to report from Confluent. Can you please share it? Yes, we're very excited to report a couple major technology advances in the implantable textile space, supporting both efficient manufacturing as well as new materials. Commonly implantable textiles are produced from synthetic fibers such as polyester. Confluent now has the capabilities of using biologic fibers such as collagen to form braids, wovens, or knotted textile forms. This opened a whole new field of applications, which we are now exploring with several customers. The healing effect and ter- Therapeutic outcomes are much greater than when biologic fibers are used versus traditional synthetic fibers. For example, in the heart valve space, we've seen the tissue valve market grown tremendously compared to traditional mechanical valve usage uh, that's decreased significantly. Excellent. Well, thank you, Christine Trepigny, Chief Technology Officer of Confluent Medical for joining us on the podcast. And thank you, Confluent Medical, for sponsoring this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. If you'd like more information about Confluent Medical, Go to confluentmedical.com. Why did you decide to hitch your your wagon to this train? After Medtronic acquired us, by contract, I worked for Medtronic for three months. Okay. Um, They refused to print a business card for me. I really would like, just give me one card so I can prove prove that I actually one day worked at Medtronic. (laughs) (laughs) So by November of 16, I realized, okay, I'm not really working right now. How do I feel about not working? Do I do I want to do what some people will do and go on boards? And and what I what I really start realized I was missing and cherished perhaps most about my experience at, at hardware was the being part of a team and and watching customers' positive reaction to your advice, but but more than anything, watching my colleagues at hardware sort of grow, learn, become sort of better at what they were doing, having their lives changed from the experience of, of being part of a build of a company. And I don't really like playing golf. So I didn't <laughs> like, I, I, I realized I, I had not built up enough hobbies to keep me busy. And, I, and, uh, and so I was very, uh, I was very flattered. I had lots of companies who wanted me to, to come and take over or run them and the like. When you sell a company for over a billion dollars, people were like, hey, I want some of that fairy dust. Maybe you can sell my company for a billion dollars. And ironically, the only company that made me actually work hard was Shockwave. Interesting. Yeah. I think they called like 20 references on me and uh, they were, they were. I think they knew, the board knew they had something special. And other than Fred Mall, I, I was, I, I didn't know any of the other board members. I think they wanted to be sure. And for me, I wanted to be sure. So I called a lot of different docs and almost anyone who had used the device. And it was not a large number of people who had used mm-hmm. the device. I called Jonathan Hill in the UK, who was one of the first users of the coronary device. And he described, I think he's the one who hooked, hooked me because I'm like, okay, how was the experience? He said, well, the first case we did it in, in, in uh, at King's College was a patient who had failed every other therapy. And so everyone in the room had seen this patient before. Everyone in the room saw me try rotablator and cutting balloons and everything, and the and the calcium wouldn't wouldn't yield. And after six, 10 shocks, all of a sudden the lesion just popped open and there's this eureka moment. And I sort of stored that away in my brain because I was trying to remember if I had ever had a device described as a eureka that I had been involved in. And I'd been involved with a lot of different devices. So mm-hmm. 
Eureka seems like a good place to start. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I tested that on some other docs like Andrew Holden in, in New Zealand, who's a peripheral doc. I said, okay, Jonathan described it as Eureka in the coronaries. Would you say, is that an accurate description of the peripheral? He said, mm, yeah, Eureka is about right. I'm like, okay. And so then I sort of realized that this is, this is very interesting because it has equal relevance in coronary and peripheral. And already three products designed, plus a long-term sort of moonshot product with uh, a project with uh, aortic valve stenosis. And what I really wanted to make sure was that I, I would join an opportunity that, that needed somebody like me, sort of somebody who likes building, building out the business and had a big enough, broad enough opportunity that I didn't have to exit to Medtronic or BSC or whomever. I wanted for it to be scalable to, to a degree where we could go public. That was sort of the gig I knew was running a public company. And for whatever reason, I, I like running a public company. <laughs> gives you access to capital that you don't have privately. It gives employees and investors a chance to exit without actually being taken over. And you get to actually hopefully realize the potential of the technology. And equally as importantly for me was having been at Hardware where we had a single product super, super complex product with 19 different sort of batteries and controllers and pumps and drive lines and all the stuff that you have to do to assemble the product. But it felt precarious when you only had one device. And then particularly when your second device didn't turn out to work quite right in the mm -hmm. clinic, it's more of a high wire act than I thought. I thought that the shockwave would be given that we had multiple shots on goal already. It seemed like a highly extendable technology platform, which I think we're, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic about, about that now than I was then. Um, I'm convinced that it is highly extendable. And in that way, it struck me that we, we really could, I could have another sort of decade long experience like I had at hardware, but a, but a more diverse and sustainable one, frankly, because you could sort of keep, keep rolling out new products and, and not have to sit and wait for somebody to come by you. What is the condition that HeartWave is, is able to treat? What are the challenges that you're able to meet or overcome with your system? So Shockwave, I think, has, has revealed to the world what maybe motivated the founders in the first place, which is that uh, cardiovascular calcium is, is the biggest challenge that face the interventionists. If you treat just a regular stenosis in the coronaries that is not calcified. Just about every cardiologist can do it, not with their eyes closed, because that would be dangerous, but it's sort of very routine. You go in, you pre-dilate, you put in a stent. There's a consistent approach, an algorithm that works almost every time if it's just a fibrotic lesion. Even if, if it's a tough fibrosis, you can use a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon and you'll be just fine. But in the 30% of the coronary patients and 40, 50% of the peripheral patients that have moderate to severe calcium, and particularly the severe calcium, things get much trickier, much complex, and the outcomes get much worse in the pre-shockwave era. So as patients, as we all in society, as we all age, and as more and more uh, folks have diabetes, uh, you have a propensity towards uh, having more, more calcified uh, a more calcified anatomy. Then you add in statins, which prevent you, your soft plaque from rupturing and having a heart attack and uh, so Lipitor and the like. That also exacerbates the propensity for the arteries to become calcified. So good news is you don't have a heart attack. Bad-ish news is your arteries are more likely to become stiffer because you're accumulating calcium that's sort of almost bone-like structure inside of the, the your vessel walls. So traditionally, again, pre-2017 when we went commercial and pre-2021 when we went commercial in the coronaries in the US, you could either inflate your balloon as best you can, hope you don't dissect, rip the vessel and put in a stent and hope that it opens up close to circumferentially like in, a, in an O shape versus a D shape. And often you would end up with a stent that was not fully opened up and you end up with what's called an underdeployed. But there's nothing you can do about it. You've sort of burnt that bridge. You can't prep the vessel because you've now delivered a stent. And now your hope is that you have not 
you have deployed it adequately, <laughs> sufficient enough so that that patient doesn't have a stent thrombosis, which would be a heart attack, lead to a heart attack, or just chest pain, so angina. And so there's this stent regret thing where you put the stent in and it wasn't quite enough. And the reason they would just use a, a balloon most of the time is that the alternative would be an, an atherectomy device, either a, a rotablator from BSC or, or Diamondback from CSI, which are high-speed spinning drills, basically. And they're better than nothing, but because you're putting a drill inside of a coronary artery, by definition, you're sort of sanding off pieces of tissue and calcium. And, and the thesis is they're small enough pieces that they don't cause adverse clinical sequelae. And, and they're very good devices and, and generally very safe, but there is a trade-off. So doctors will use them, particularly in the coronaries, they will use them very reluctantly and only when they absolutely need them because they know there's sort of a cost benefit that they have to weigh. So you have a subset of the doctors who use atherectomy in the coronaries. More of them use it in the peripheral, but in the coronaries, a subset use them. And there's a large percentage of the doctors who don't do any atherectomy. So they'll refer those patients to somebody else, or they'll run for luck and put a stent in and hope it's deployed adequately. Along comes shockwave and they've, we have a form factor that is so comfortable for doctors because they, almost every interventional procedure uses a guide wire and a balloon at least once. Even if you do atherectomy, you almost always use a balloon too. So you take the most comfortable interventional tool in a balloon and you put it in the hands of a doctor and say, all you have to do that's different is inflate it to lower pressures and push a button. Like that's it. Like in that same conversation with Donna, Jonathan Hill back in 2016, 17, I said, so what's the learning curve? He said about a half a case, maybe. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, oh, that, that's nice. <laughs> So we fit so seamlessly into the flow of the procedure because they, they would have picked a different balloon, not our balloon. So now they're picking ours and they're putting over the same guide wire they always use. They don't have to pick a new guide wire and they just have to make sure they're using an adequately sized product and not over inflating it and then pushing a button to activate it. So it's, it's a very comfortable and simple technology for them, for them to use. And that has certainly accrued to our, our benefit, particularly once we got over the skepticism hump, um, mm -hmm. when they with they either talked to enough friends or they saw enough data or they saw enough live cases, we're like, okay, this thing is not a wiggly balloon. This is actually doing something meaningful. So, what happens after the button is pushed and the energy is delivered and the calcium is is broken up? Is that the end of the procedure, or is there a next step? We're an exceptionally safe and effective and, and predictable what's called a vessel prep. So we prepare the vessel usually for something else. Most of our procedures, whether it's peripheral or coronary, the calcium, there's some, there's not as much confusion as it used to be. People used to assume that we break up the calcium and then it spills out into the vessel. The, the calcium is actually integrated into the layers of the vessel wall. It's not like stalactites poking into the lumen of the vessel. So they don't break off. What we do is when the sound waves are activated inside the balloon, so it's a little electrical pulse that creates bubbles, the bubbles create sound waves as they expand and contract. And those sound waves pass through the soft tissue, get absorbed by the calcium and create shear stresses inside of the calcium that leads to fractures, sort of circumferential longitudinal fractures. And so I, I, I think of it as sort of, you're creating hinges. You have this circle of calcium that is fully connected within the, the vessel of the or the wall of the vessel sometimes it's circular sometimes it's more um, eccentric but as those sound waves pulse through the calcium they create shear stresses and then, then there it will find weak points in that calcium and it cracks the calcium and the vessel then relaxes and becomes more compliant more similar to a non-calcified vessel except it still has calcium in there so now it's more chunks of calcium versus a an integrated sheet of calcium and so now the vessel goes from whatever it is pre-treatment, two millimeters, two and a half millimeters to four or five, six, whatever the vessel is. And because we do our treatment at very, very low pressures, we our balloon inflates to four atmospheres when you do the treatment and we tell you to take it up to six. If they were using a regular angioplasty balloon, they might be at 20, 30 atmospheres. So 
sort of order of magnitude more pressure. And when they put in that more pressure, it tends to increase the risk that you're just going to tear the soft tissue, and not really crack the calciums. So in the coronaries in the US, they will put a stent in after our device nearly 100% of the time. We'll see in the future if drug-coated balloons show up in the coronaries as they have in Japan. In Japan, they're more like 40% of the time they're using drug-coated balloons in the, in the coronaries. In the periphery, depending on the vessel, if we're in the iliacs, they'll put in a stent. If we're in the common femoral or the, the superficial femoral, they'll tend to use a DCB after us. And we think that combination of very, very safe vessel expansion with shockwave followed by end therapy, stent or in the coronaries or DCB in the periphery is a really elegant way of uh, avoiding the complications up front with shockwave and increasing the likelihood of, of a long-term positive outcome with either drug-coated stent in the coronaries or a drug-coated balloon in the, in the periphery. So where does your larger opportunity lie? Is it on the coronary or the periphery? I mean, there's obviously a lot to do down the peripheral area below the knees. Where are you focusing or I imagine you're focusing on both, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, what's focus, what's next? Focus on everything. Um, yeah, right. Uh, the peripheral space is, it's obviously a more uh, diverse geography. Sure. So the, the renals down to the toes, and, which means you have a lot of different kinds of vessels, different different objectives. And I mean, the objective is always get the get better blood flow to wherever you're going get blood mm-hmm. better better blood flow to the to the core to the uh, myocardium or get better blood flow to the foot uh, so that is uh everybody wants a beautiful angiographic image after the procedure where the vessel's wide open and you don't have like a, any adverse events you don't have em- embolism which we never have you don't have dissections which we don't tend to have severe dissections and yet there are six million coronary procedures around the world. Coronary is a much broader, is a more universal procedure. Peripheral is biased to a U.S. model where because of reimbursement in the U.S. being stronger, more people do, more patients get intervened on in the periphery in the U.S. as a percent of the population than in other countries. Whereas in the coronaries, we have about the same number of coronary interventions as they do in Europe. Whereas in the periphery, we probably have twice as many or three times as many peripheral interventions as they have in Europe. And that's driven in large part because in Europe, they're just more constrained in terms of what the reimbursement holds. So that being said, there's more calcium in the periphery. We treat them equally in terms of our enthusiasm and interest uh, internally. And we see a need for more tools in the periphery because of the, the variety of dimensions and nature of peripheral calcification. The calcium below the knee, there's a lot of it, and it tends to be fairly long, diffuse lesions. In the common femoral, it's very concentrated, dense uh, lesions, so you sort of need a very different design in the common femoral than you need below the knee, et cetera. Uh, and so our, our expectation in coming years, we already have two peripheral devices. Uh, we just announced that we're going to be launching an upgrade to, our, to one of those two. But by 2025, 2026, we will have multiple, well, more than two, probably closer to five peripheral devices that will, that will be commercializing and we'll have a smaller number, but, in, but one or two coronary devices that will be enhanced versions or iterations off of, of what we have today with our C2 device. Thanks for all the, all the time. Can you talk a bit about the relationship with, with Abiomed? Is that related to, I imagine that's related to the, the coronary part of your portfolio? What comes from that partnership? Where, where does that go? Or investment, not partnership. Yeah, yeah, right. We, um, yeah. So Mike and I, back to my hardware days, he still pumps blood, although for a shorter period of times than I yeah. did, whereas, whereas I pumped blood for a decade and, uh, and with a permanent implant. We've known each other because of sort of very similar space and experience between, uh, between our two companies. And we talked a bit when I, when I joined Shockwave and and he expressed interest in, in investing in the company. And at the time, I had just brought in Fidelity and Tiro. I couldn't quite figure out why I would also bring in Abiumed, but he um, continued to stay in touch and continued to express interest. And, and he, heard, he had heard such positive things about Shockwave from some of the same docs, like Jonathan Hill was, kept telling Mike, this Shockwave thing is pretty special. And then he started hearing that we were 
being used to facilitate impella delivery through iliac arteries. One of the sort of novel uses of shockwave that really, frankly, was the springboard for our our peripheral business was that we we were able to safely uh, open up calcified iliac arteries to facilitate passage of large bore catheters, whether it's you know stent grafts or TAVI devices or or impella. And so when he suddenly heard about that synergistic application of shockwave, we open the iliacs. He gets to sell an impella that he otherwise might not have been able to sell. Uh, he said, okay, I still want to invest, but let's also do start collaborating and doing training. So that was 18 was probably when we, when we took that investment and started doing training together, which uh, we still do, although less so. And that investment was really, as it turns out, incredibly helpful pre-IPO because it was a validation from a company that doesn't tend to do those kinds of external, you know, like Abumed, particularly the right. time, was not, was not prolific on the BD front. They've done more over the past couple of years. And great timing leading into an IPO because it sort of uh, both validated us, set a price below which we didn't have to worry about going, going into our IPO. And it turned out to be a rather shrewd investment on, on their part that, that uh, things paid off very nicely for them. And so we, we remain sort of collaborators, but, but it's not a sort of a core component of our our strategy is to, as we as we thought it might be, we thought, okay, we, we can really leverage Abbey Med's uh, substantial training capabilities. It turns out we kind of didn't need that in part because there was such demand, for, particularly for our coronary device, and our device is kind of dumb, simple to use. So it's there's only so much training you really need to do. A lot of our training takes place in the lab as the docs are seeing cases like, okay, how will I, how do I think about this? How do I make sure I really need shockwave? Cause we don't want them to use it unless they really need it. And what are the different use cases, whether it's in the coronaries or the, or the periphery. We collaborate with other companies as well uh, for, for training in Europe. We do a lot with Abbott, for example, on sort of imaging combined with, with shockwave. And we've done some joint dinners with, with Penumbra. Uh, so we're, there are some companies who obviously have no interest in collaborating with us because they see us as a threat, but uh, we're fairly open-minded because we do think, I mean, we, we think we make almost everybody else's therapy better because we're the key first step in safely managing calcified arteries. And if we can, if we can get that vessel to, to behave a little bit more like an uncalcified vessel, then your stents are going to work better. Your drug coated balloons are going to work better. And even your atherectomy catheter is used in tandem with shockwave is probably a better, safer way of managing a lot of these patients because you can do the first step with, you can kind of drill a hole, but now, now all you have to do is drill a small hole. You don't have to use bigger and bigger devices to try to expand the vessel, just drill the hole and then follow up with, with shockwave, which um, is affectionately called rota shock, where you use rota blader followed by shockwave. Final question. You mentioned you like being a public company. You announced recently your uh, your results for 2021. You had uh, you had a full year revenue for 2021 was 237.1 million, representing a 250 percent increase, which is uh, which is a really nice big number to have in your earning report. Talk a bit about the future, sort of where you go from here. And and I'll, I have to add because in getting ready for this interview, I came upon headlines. I guess being a public company makes you makes you the subject of of acquisition talk and things like that. How does that sort of factor into to your work there? Is it a distraction? Is it just uh, is it just something you have to deal with? What is it like being a public company, and sort of what sort of growth do you see going forward? Yeah, you have to savor the the one time or rare times in your career when you get to say things like two hundred fifty percent increase and four hundred four hundred two percent increase in in the U.S. <laughs> like like those are big numbers. <laughs> it's. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't like we went from uh, from two million to five million. So it's uh, going from sixty eight roughly to two thirty seven is a testament to how exceptional our team is and how profound the need was for all of our devices, but in particular our coronary device. We didn't have an internal model that in the upside in the best case upside scenario we would do two hundred thirty million last year. So luckily, our our head of our operations. And I are both paranoid enough that he kept saying, I think the marketing number is too low. So I'm going to build more if that's okay with you. And I said, yes, that's fine with me because I've, I've seen 
when you underestimate the demand and it kills a launch because you just put everybody in the back order. So we, to his credit, he was like maniacally paranoid. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, his paranoia paid off, thankfully. So we guided 405 to 425 for this year. Uh, so up from 237, which is uh, being, being in, in a position to be able to give that kind of guidance is humbling, frankly, to, to think that we're going to kind of do it again this year. Uh, and our intention is to try to find a way to do it every year. Um, now, I'm not going to have 250% growth year every year because that, <laughs> that, like at some juncture, you run out of calcium. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but but we're, not, we're not there yet. And we think as much as we are amazed by the technology that we, we have this great fortune of being associated with, it's not as good as it needs to be. We got to keep getting better. Customers love it, but they tell us every day what they wish was wish wish we could do even better than what we do today and give them tools that could treat some of the patients that we are unable to treat today. And so that's my favorite thing to do every week is I walk into the lab several, like as soon as I get in the office, I walk in the in the R&D lab and I sort of ask everybody, so what have, like, what have you done lately? What's what have, what have you done since last week when I was here and you showed me your latest idea? And We've more than doubled the number of R&D projects uh, over the past 12 months. We are in the process of trying to more than double our R&D team. We started last year with 40 people. We're going to end this year with over 100 and techs and, and R&D folks. We had really inventive, sort of capable folks in the, in the R&D team. And somehow we keep attracting in, incredibly capable, creative individuals to, to complement the ones that we already had. So we're, uh, we're on a bit of a hiring spree in R&D because we're, we're increasingly bullish about, about the collection of projects we have, which are sort of a, a blend of iterative improvements, sort of line extension, the kind of a products that you, you have to do to keep the franchise fresh and uh, very different applications of our technology. And so still staying largely within our uh, sort of core tech platform, but we think treating patients, meaningfully different patients than we're able to treat today. Um, the, the one that everybody knows about is our aortic valve project. Uh, we're, we're increasingly optimistic that, that we've latched onto a design path that'll have something that will be, that should work, help the management of, of some of the patients with uh, aortic stenosis. We haven't put a pin exactly yet, at least publicly, into when we think we'll be back in the clinic. We had an early version that was too finicky, too user dependent, which usually means the product doesn't work, in my view. So uh, we think we're going to have a similar to our arterial device today. Uh, we want something that every doc can pick up and use and not require a whole lot of training and fidgeting to apply to a patient. Very cool. Well, it's uh, an amazing story. Best of luck uh, ramping up on your R&D. It's going to be interesting to see what you come up with next. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. We're, uh, we're delighted to be invited, Tom. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the interest. It really is. Uh, it's a fun story to be associated with. I, I'm, I'm lucky I convinced the board to join, to hire me several years ago. <laughs> <laughs> sounded, sounded like a, it was a harder sell than I would have anticipated, but they got the right guy. So thanks again. All right, Chris Newmarker, let's make this fast. Where are you on Twitter? Hey, you can find me on Twitter at Newmarker. You can find me on LinkedIn, Chris Newmarker, just like a Newmarker. And I am on Twitter at MedTechTom. I am on LinkedIn, Tom, S-A-L-E-M-I. Chris Newmarker, what am I going to ask people to do next? Hey, you know, all things device hawks and mass device, you got to like, follow, subscribe. Absolutely. Well said. And uh, please do share this podcast episode on those social media channels. Please do subscribe, as Chris said. To, uh, to this podcast, to our other, if you subscribe to this podcast channel, you also get Striker Talks and Intuitive Talks. Please also subscribe to Medtronic Talks. And of course, plan on attending our upcoming events. You can go to devicetalks.com to see the details on Device Talks Boston, which is happening on May 10th and 11th in Boston, of course, and Device Talks Minnesota, which is happening in Minneapolis on June 6th and 7th. We have agendas up for both. And uh, because we love you, because you listen to this podcast, use the code DTW. 25 to save 25% off the cost of registration. You got to be there or be square. All right. I got you, babe. <laughs>